Psalm 116. I've been doing the 16, 16s Bible as best I can, but there's no Psalm 16, 16. So I uh, thought, well, there's 116, 16. And I hardly ever preach in that part of Psalms, so I thought, well, okay, we'll go with that. Psalm 116, 16. O oh Lord, <clears throat> surely I am your servant. <clears throat> I am your servant, the son of a handmaid. <clears throat> you have loosed my bones. Okay. Well, that's kind of an interesting verse. Uh, I am your servant, <clears throat> son of your handmaid. Uh, you loosed my bones. Okay, well, in order to be a servant <clears throat> of God, you've got to have your bonds loosed. So I got to thinking about that and and uh, actually, there's quite a few things uh, in this psalm that, uh, that kind of talk about that. Um, I like verse 11. He said, I said in my alarm, all men are liars. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, you know, we see a lot of that. And uh, the, uh, he said in verse 8, he said, you have rescued my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed when I said, I am greatly afflicted. So, you know, what this does is starts showing us the human condition. And uh, God wants us to recall, you know, what it was like before we were in Christ. Okay? Uh, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 for just a second here. Second Peter chapter 1. He says, uh, there's a bunch of qualities that we're supposed to develop. He said, verse 5, now for this very reason also, 2 Peter 1, 5, apply all diligence. In your faith, supply moral excellence, and your moral excellence, knowledge, your knowledge, self-control, your self-control, perseverance, your perseverance, godliness, your godliness, brotherly kindness, your brotherly kindness, love. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful, and the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, he says, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. So, you know, the, the point I'm driving at here is if we forget, if we forget the value of our purification from our former sins, then we end up being blind or short-sighted. So there's, you know, the scripture is, is going to remind us on a periodic basis, okay, this is where you came from. You know, don't forget it, buddy. Uh, you are where you are now by the power and grace of Christ, not by your own efforts. Ephesians chapter 2. Another one. I'm just selecting a couple of representatives here. Ephesians 2, 1. It said you were dead in your trespasses and sins. See, kind of like he was talking about in Psalms, you know, being dead. You know, uh, you were dead, spiritually dead, in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, being ch uh, children of wrath, even as rest. But God, seeing, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, and even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, raised us up with Christ. See, it's in immersion is when that actually happened. But see, the scripture is going to go back and remind us, okay, this is where you were. Okay. So going back to Psalm 116 then, see the, the consciousness here of the, of the individual was of the fact that he was in bondage and that he's been loose from his bonds. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the, you know, the nature of some of that. Um, in verse 3, Psalm 116, 3, he said, The cords of death encompassed me. Terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, Save my life. Sheol. Sheol is the Old Testament name for the realm of the dead. Now the fact is, is unless Jesus comes, 
every single individual in this room at some point going to experience physical death. It's not something people usually like to think about. I'd say, what, about 80% of people don't have wills? Okay, and why don't they have wills? Well, they don't want to think about dying. You know, I've actually talked to some people and said, you know, you really should have a will. Well, I'm afraid to have a will because if I get a will, I'll die. Okay? Well, you know how people's minds, uh, you know, go down certain tracks, okay? Uh, you know, the point is they don't want to think about it. And so because they don't want to think about it, then they don't do. You know, and I always try to remind young people, you know, you really want the state of Montana deciding what's going to happen to your kids if something happens to you? I mean, that's the state of Montana's record <laughs> in regard to kids. See? So it's something, you, you know, you have to think about, even though maybe it's unpleasant to contemplate the fact that your heart is going to pump its last pump, your lungs are going to breathe the last breath. I mean, the fact is, it's, it's something you have to sit down, you have to think about, and you have to deal with it, all right? But a lot of people don't because they don't want to think about it. Um, the same process is when people, you know, when start thinking about, well, what happens when you die? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to think about that because I might die. Well, I can't write. You know? Now, if a will is important with regard to what the state of Montana is going to do with your kids, it's much more important to get it right with God as to where you're going to spend eternity. You know, the devil is really good at, you know, making us think that the only thing that matters is here and now. You know, quality of life. You know, I remember uh, meeting with the, the doctor when, when Lana was, you know, getting informed about the fact that she had pancreatic cancer. And, and uh, the, uh, you know, Diamond was there, and I was there, and Lana was there. And... So what the doctor was concerned about was making sure she had quality of life. Quality of life. Now, you, you, if you guys knew, know Lana, I mean, Lana was straight arrow. I mean, okay, she, you know, she said, okay, well, if I suffer for a little while, but I go to heaven, that's the main thing, you know? I mean, that's where she was at. And, uh, see, the doctor was all about quality of life, you know? Lana was all about quality of eternity, Okay? Well, that's a, huge, that's a huge difference in perspective, isn't it? And, um, but see, that's where, that's where the world focuses on this life, this life, this life. You know, and that's why we talked before. They keep pounding at you, fear of death, fear of death, fear of death. Okay, this whole panic here, uh, pandemic, panicdemic, you know, this whole thing is based on fear of death, isn't it? You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that won't go out of their houses for fear of death. Well, maybe they should be. <laughs> they don't have it right with God, but the solution is to get it right with God. You know, the, the Bible says that the devil uses fear of death to keep people in slavery all their lives. So they don't think about it. God really wants the human race to process this and to think about it so that then they'll do the right thing. You know, you, any rational person is going to think about the difference between heaven on one side and hell on the other, you know, everybody choose heaven. You know, I mean, hell is, that's forever. And, uh, you know, the Bible paints a lot of pictures about hell. Gee, it's, it's reserved to Jesus himself personally to be the one who has the most scripture about hell, hellfire, Gehenna. You know, most of that is, is Jesus himself is the one who talks about it. He was conscious about it. We've mentioned before the great golden verse of the, verse of the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus was conscious of the fact that people were going to perish, that is, they were going to go to hell. And that was one of these great motivations of coming from heaven to earth. That was a driving force, was to rescue man. You know, I think uh, Jason referenced it in his prayer, you know, that the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Okay. So that's, that's on Jesus' mind on a continual basis because he knows the condition. He said, I didn't come to judge the world. I mean, the world was already judged. He said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. See, he knew uh, what their condition was. He tried to let us know, look, it, this is your condition. Apart from Jesus Christ, this is your condition. This is where you're going to end up. 
Okay, well, that's where the human brain, with a little help from the devil, uh, starts to, uh, my buddy Jim Palmer in Missoula puts it, pop out of gear. Okay? You know, just jump, just jump the track, see, and, and not follow that, that line of thinking down. And the devil's very good at helping people not think about it. You know, and the appeal, one of the great appeals is the good things of this life, and the other great appeal is fear of death. Those two work together to keep people from really thinking about what they should do with regard to God. Well, turn to Mark chapter 8. Jesus is really trying to help us understand the nature of this bondage, you know, the, bond, the slave, the servant, the bondage. He said, you loose my bonds. Okay, well, the first thing you got to do is you got to recognize you're in bondage. Okay. So Jesus is, is talking then. Um, he says in verse 34, some of the crowd with his disciples said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And once again, Jesus is conscious of the eternal value of each person's soul. And conscious of the fact that, you know, it's, you, know you gain the whole world, you lose your soul. On the other hand, he said, you lose your life for my sake and the gospels. He said, you'll save it. So he's conscious of both the problem and the solution. But he's conscious of the problem. And so God wants us to honestly process what we, what our eternity would be like without Christ. He'd like us to pause every so often and think about that so that we don't become blind or short-sighted. When you're blind or short-sighted spiritually, then your, your perspective is warped. When your perspective is warped, you're not going to put the proper value on the things that you should be putting the proper value on. And you're going to be putting value on the things where you shouldn't be putting a lot of value on. It all, it all gets out of whack. So, what did Jesus do then to, to rescue his servants from bondage? He'd like us to, to also process that. Having presented the problem, he, he goes to work on the solution. Go to Romans chapter 5. Again, this, this stuff is all through the scripture. Romans chapter 5 and, and verse 6. Romans 5, 6. It says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for the righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Again, the description of a person who's outside of Christ is an enemy. Enemy of God. Enemy of Christ. Okay. I remember I was studying with a couple down in Belgrade years ago, and uh, she was kind of a very emotional lady and uh, taller than I was and probably stronger than I was and, uh, you know, I hate to admit that publicly, but, you know. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm studying and I, I hit the point where I said, you know, look at what you got to understand is that this, because she was getting a little, you know, kind of strongly, you know, saying I was overstating the case. I said, look, you got to understand, you are, at this point, you are an enemy of Christ. Well, she did get hostile, okay? And I figured that the appropriate thing to do was to leave the trailer house, you know, at that point. Uh, so you having a hard time processing the fact that she, in her condition, was an enemy. Okay, but see, if you're going to let the scripture be the authority, and the scripture says, okay, you're an enemy, then we need to process that. Okay, I, that's, that's me, an enemy. Well, I didn't know I was an enemy. But that's what the scripture says I am. While we were the enemies, see, Christ died for us. You know, if you're a person with, uh, I've sometimes used the illustration, let's, and let's use it again today. Let's say you're in Jerusalem. Uh, it's uh, Passover. Uh, 
you've participated in the Passover meal in the in twilight, the evening before, and uh, so you're up early in the morning. You know, you're, you know, you're one of these guys that wakes up about four o'clock in the morning, and uh, you know, besides that, it's a strange bed. You know, you can't, you know how that works. You're not sleeping well anyway. I mean, because you're from out of town, and uh, so about four o'clock in the morning, you know, you kind of wander downtown and you kind of hear a ruckus going on down at the, where uh, the, the governor's palace is. And so you, you check it out, you know, you walk in a little bit closer to investigate. And uh, you see there's a guy there that's right there in the presence of the governor himself. I mean, he's there on the, the judgment seat, the, the Gabbatha. He's, you know, he's on the bima, you know, the, and he's ready to execute judgment. And you see this guy standing there. He's already, I mean, you can tell he's been whipped and beaten pretty bad already. And uh, you get there just in time to see, see him bring this guy out, you know, whipped and beaten. And you get to hear Pilate say in Latin, exi homo, you know, which means behold the man. There's your man, okay? And then the question is, what should I do with him? Well, see, then the riot starts, you know, crucify him, crucify him. See, and of course, riots, th these guys know how to, to get these things going. You know, I mean, Gary was talking about the peaceful protesters. You know, they know how to, to get it agitated. See, one of the things they use is a rhythmic chant. You know, get, you know, the, you get the chant going, you get the rhythm going. What that does is gets the blood pumping and it turns the brain into mush. See, that's, you know, it's a good system. And so you can hear the crowd saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. So you get going. See, Pilate sees that mom <clears throat> forming. And so he says, okay, okay. Um, we're going to execute judgment. Remember, uh, they bring out a, he calls for a pan of water. And so he washes his hands of the matter. And that's where our expression, washing the hands of the matter, comes from. And uh, then he delivers him up to be crucified. And you think, it's, you know, this is kind of interesting because there's a couple other criminals here. But this guy, when they, when they write the sign, they write it to uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, you could read, okay, the Latin side would be Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judiori, okay? And you could read that because, you know, I mean, you're there early, but you speak English. See? And so Latin letters are the same as English letters, so you could read that. And... Uh, has written in Hebrew and Latin and Greek. And uh, so this guy's chart, these other guys, you know, murder, you know, thug, you know, anarchist, whatever. But this guy, the charge against him is that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. He's the king of the Jews. Well, that's interesting. So you follow the procession out of town, you follow up the hill, and uh, you know, you, you get up there, you stand a little bit of distance, and so you watch the crucifixion. And you know, you notice this guy's different. I mean, he's not he's not spewing out threats and murder and everything like the other two guys hanging on crosses are. You know. Uh, and this guy's calm. And also it's really interesting because now all the chief priests and the leading Jewish hierarchy, they're coming by his cross. They're saying, Oh, so you're the son of God, huh? Come down off the cross, then we'll believe it. Yeah, he saved others. He can't save himself, you know. And all this mocking going on. I said, what? I said, what is going on? See? And then, about noon, it turns dark. Now, there's never been a crucifixion that you've ever heard of anybody witnessing in their life where it turned dark at noon. And this is no solar eclipse. I mean, those of you who got to see the solar eclipse... I came through Idaho here a couple years ago. You know, you were in there maybe two and a half, three minutes, right? Okay? <clears throat> and, uh, okay, so something that's dark for three hours, that is not a solar eclipse, and there is no natural explanation for it. Definition of a miracle, by the way, is when the laws of, of nature are suspended. See, when Jesus walks on the water, that's a miracle. The laws of nature are suspended. Somebody says, oh, they're miraculously healed. You know, they didn't think they're going to recover from the heart attack or cancer. That's not miraculous at all. See, the laws of nature aren't suspended. You know, maybe it's a wonderful cure. Maybe prayer <coughs> was involved. 
but it's not a miracle. Okay, so you got to understand what a what a miracle is. When that when that was dark from noon until three, that's a miracle. That's a sign. That's a that's a wonder. Okay, so you're saying, well, this, this is amazing. Okay. And uh, toward the end, you know, you notice that one of the thieves, you know, kind of changes his tune instead of starting spewing out all the invectives and imprecations against Jesus. He and he says, uh, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Okay? And you kind of overhear Jesus' words, today you'll be in your paradise. Uh, okay, but you're, you're thinking about that. And uh, then he says, I'm thirsty. And they take a sponge, dip it in a jug of vinegar that's standing there, and uh, <clears throat> put it on a, a branch of hyssop and put it up to his lips. And uh, he, he tastes it, and he said, it is finished. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. All of a sudden, then, there's this massive earthquake. I mean, the, you're, you're there up on the hill. You're at the place of the skull. And the rocks are actually split and open. There's a massive earthquake. And it gets light again. And you're watching. There's a, <clears throat> I pictured kind of a grizzled old <clears throat> Roman centurion, you know, the, the veteran of many a campaign. And he sees this whole proceeding going on. He says, truly, this was the Son of God. And you watch in a little while, some, some guys come, soldiers come up the hill, and they get to the first thief, and they break his legs, and they get to the second thief, they break his legs, so to be dead before sundown, get the bodies down off the crosses. <clears throat> get to the guy in the middle, they don't break his legs. The soldier punches a spear in his side, and you can kind of see the plasma and the corpuscles come out. And, uh, and then not too long after that, you see some, some other guys come, you know, about two different companies of guys. <clears throat> One of them comes and they take the body down off the cross. The other guys have got about 100 pounds of spices and they wrap them and, you know, you kind of follow them a little bit and they come to a cave. Actually, it's a, a tomb that's actually been hollowed out by, by, by chisel work because they didn't have dynamite in those days. And it's actually a tomb hollowed out of a, a cliff. And you watch him put Jesus' body in there, and you watch the stone get rolled in place, and then you got to leave because it's sundown, right? Gonna... Okay. Now you watched all that, and you had no idea what it was all about. You know, it's curious. You watched it, you didn't... You didn't a couple days later, you hear rumors that the same guy was resurrected. So you don't, you don't know what that's all about. <clears throat> See, what it does is it takes the preaching of the apostles in the book of Acts to start putting together the significance and then the information that's in the letters. See, then we start seeing the significance. <clears throat> See, even though we were yet sinners, Christ, what? <clears throat> Died for us. See, in other words, we start to see that Jesus is a sacrifice to be substituted on our behalf. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't have seen that without the revelation. And of course, you can go back and check the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament prophesies this is what's going to happen. You know, his death, his burial. It says he was pierced through for our transgressions, right? It says it. I mean, it's, uh, it's all in you. So you could, with the teaching from the apostles in the book of Acts, <coughs> excuse me, and, and the, what's in the letters, then we can start to process what the witnesses saw, the significance of what the witnesses saw as recorded in the gospel accounts. Now there's some things that hint at it. See, John the Immerser, you know, he's, he immersed Jesus. Jesus went up in the wilderness for 40 days. When Jesus comes back, there's old John the Immerser there on the banks of the Jordan. Got a couple of disciples, uh, Andrew, and future Apostle Andrew, and future Apostle John. And John Mercer says to the guy, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, I imagine those guys, are, you know, that would not make any sense to them at that point at all. Looking back, though, to be able to see the significance. He was the Passover Lamb, wasn't he? He also was Passover Lamb. Having his blood sprinkled 
for the forgiveness of sins. Of those who would enter into the, the place specified, you know, where the blood of the Lamb covers. There was <clears throat> significance, but be lost without the explanation. So that's what, of course, the, the Bible is all about. Going back to Psalm 116, see, this, the scripture is really pointing to this. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm your servant. You know, I, <clears throat> the cords of Sheol <clears throat> were upon me. The cords of death encompassed me. I, I was trapped in a system of death that was going to take me ultimately to the fires of hell. And there's no amount of human effort that I could do to get myself out of that. It's going to take what Jesus did, as revealed in the gospel accounts, and expounded upon by the apostles and the New Testament prophets, in order for us to understand how this takes place. <clears throat> See, that's a, it's an amazing thing when you think about it. Um, I, I don't know how my sister Sherry processed things going up, you know, I, I mean, you know, in some senses we had different childhoods, uh, you know, because the interaction was, was different, but uh, I remember my mother, mother reading the Bible when I was a little kid. I think I still have possession of the King James Bible that she was reading somewhere, okay? Pause off. And uh, <laughs> she would sit on the couch and she put her hair up in these pin curls, you know, Anybody else remember their mothers doing something like that? And uh, <clears throat> she'd read her Bible, but somehow that, I don't know where that changed. I, I was pretty little, <clears throat> and that changed. And so, <clears throat> personally, I, I grew up with no concept of Jesus doing anything. I did attend a vacation Bible school run by the Presbyterians when I was about 13 years old, and I did memorize the books of the Bible, but as far as anything else, well, what would you expect from the Presbyterians, you know? anything else relevant I didn't I think maybe I learned about King Solomon you know gonna do, split the kid in half or you know David and Goliath or something but you know I didn't as far as learning anything about Jesus no See, so it's very easy <clears throat> to grow up in a situation where you've got no concept it, it doesn't even cross your mind that there's a heaven and there's a hell it didn't cross your mind about the, the spiritual condition that you're in. See, because you're just chugging along, uh, doing your best, making your way through life, uh, trying to handle the challenges as best you can, can, you know, trying to maintain positive attitude, trying to position yourself where you can actually make a living and, and things like that. You don't, you, you, eternity doesn't cross your mind, at least it didn't mind. And so here comes the gospel into the world See, stabbing like a light into the darkness. <clears throat> See, trying to get people aware of the fact that, yes, you know what? At some point, your heart's going to beat its last. At some point, those lungs are going to breathe their last time. And you are going to face death. What is, what's going to happen? Would you like to know what's going to happen? Would you be interested <clears throat> in what's going to happen when you die? This something that's got the answers. You know, Jesus himself said, he said, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. You know, these other guys can really tell you anything about what happens on the other side of the grave. I mean, they can, but they're lying, okay? They don't know. Make it up. Um, so, <clears throat> Scripture, though, is telling us exactly, and it's letting us know what our dread condition was, apart from Christ, and then it's telling us what Christ did. See, and, and it's painting the picture, okay, this is heaven over here, this is hell over here, and without what Christ did in the middle, you're going to the hell side. Do you think what Christ did is valuable? Lord's Supper is a reminder designed by Jesus himself to help us continually process the significance of what he did on our behalf. His death as a sacrifice, his intercessory ministry as the great high priest in order to rescue us. Okay, he has to do that. Okay. Well, now the next question is, well, is everybody automatically going to heaven? If Jesus did this, or 
This is all, this is clearly for all men, all mankind. He he did it for all mankind. So is everybody automatically saved then, so to speak? Is everybody automatically going to heaven because of what Jesus did? That's another fair question, isn't it? Logical question. I mean, if the if if the son, you know, the child of a of a woman, you know, hitting maturity. In other words, we're all we all have mothers. Okay. And so if an individual then hits maturity and starts recognizing, you know what, I'm I'm in a bad condition here. Okay. Well, we'd like to know what Jesus did to rescue us. Okay. But we'd like to also know, is there anything I got to do? Okay, so this is what Jesus did for me. Uh, what's do I have a part in this? Is it automatic? Well, scripture is pretty plain. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> Sometimes the scripture in human terms is just brutal. It seems that way because here's the problem. You know, Elliot brought out this morning, there's truth, right? Now anything that's not 100% true is a lie. So if it's 98% true, it's a lie. It's brutal, isn't it? Brutal. Okay. Um, you know, human race tends to like gray areas, you know, just kind of drift into a gray area. You know, it kind of reminds me, I was having a Bible study with a guy one time, and he said, look, if God and the devil want to have their warfare, fine, leave me out of it. Okay. <laughs> leave me out of it. I said, well, the problem is if you're breathing, you're involved. And you, don't, you don't get to opt out. Okay? Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's talking in verse 7 about uh, the suffering that the early Christians went through and how God's going to give them relief. He's going to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well. 2 Thessalonians 7. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with these mighty angels in flame and fire. He is coming back. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So the scripture is saying, okay, here's your brutal line. Here's, there's a line here. It's a very clear, a very defined line. That you're either on one side or the other. Okay, the, the retribution, see, the punishment of this eternal hell that we talked about is come out, coming upon two groups of people. Number one, those who do not know God to start with. And number two, those who do not obey the gospel. See, in other words, the individual is going to have to be active in this process. This, this servant here, the, you know, the, the child of the woman here, is going to have to be active in order to have those bonds loosed. It's, it's not automatic. And the terminology here is to obey the gospel. You know, gospel, of course, means good news. Um, people act like the gospel is bad news. You know, you know, same old, same old. Okay, bad news. <laughs> well, uh, okay, the difference between heaven and hell is the gospel. And good news is that you don't have to go to hell. Uh, the good news is, is through Jesus Christ, you can go to heaven. Well, that's, there's no better news out there than that. If, again, if you're willing to process at the level God would like us to process. No better news at all. And, uh, and you, know, I, you know, Katie and I and a bunch of the others got to attend the wedding yesterday of uh, uh, Joseph Martin and, and Kimberly Miller. And uh, pretty exciting. And, uh, you know, it's great time, exciting, great young couple, you know, got pretty well got their lives together, and, and uh, I mean, if, if Joe loses his job, Kimberly can still support him, I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a good deal, you know, and uh, it was great, you know, great to see that young couple, and, and everybody there, you know, most everybody, family, Christian, brother, you know, I mean, guys from Williston came over, and the guys from Spokane came over, and yeah, you know, it was a great time. It was, uh, it was good news. You know, good news is, hey, this couple 
got married, they, they tied the knot. I always, always like the term hitched. Well, they got hitched because the purpose of being hitched is so you can go to work, you know. And that, that, that's what marriage is about. It's, it's not so much, uh, you know, uh, uh, roses on the pillow in the morning and uh, pretty much work, you know. Nice to have a little love along the way, you know, a little TLC, you know, it's pretty nice. Uh, but a lot of times it's a lot of work, and uh, so I like the term hitch. But it's good news, see, it's good. But the gospel is a lot better news than that. The fact is, the marriage was designed by God to point to the gospel, to point to the union of Christ, okay? But the judgment of God is coming upon those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel. That, that is the absolute, solid, immutable fact that nobody gets to get around in honesty. Like I say, the human brain starts to go into work, you know, well, maybe I can get out of this. Maybe I got an excuse. Maybe, <clears throat> well, maybe there's another way, you know. Um, I mean, Jesus was looking for that. That's kind of a human thing. The, 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 the cross is looming on his mental horizon and he's in the garden of Gethsemane praying so hard that his sweat was like drops of blood falling on the ground. He says, Father, if it's possible, let this cut pass from me. See, he's looking for another, if there's another way, let's do it. And the only thing is, there wasn't any other way. And the same way, you know, there, there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Book of Acts, he said, there is salvation in no other name other than the name of Jesus Christ. There's no other name by which salvation is given to men. Now, part of that one way, of course, you've got to believe the scripture. I mean, you've got to, okay, let's say a person's having a little trouble saying, I'm not sure I believe the scripture. Well, the answers are there. You may have to dig for them a little bit. But no matter how deep you want to dig, you know, you want to test the authenticity of the manuscripts, go ahead. You want to test the validity of the testimony of Jesus' resurrection, test it. You want to test the validity of the Old Testament scriptures, test it. God invites those tests. You know, the answers are there. Well, I'm not sure I want to look that hard. Oh, that might be the problem. Okay. You want the answers? They're there. And they stand as, as facts. And prove that the Bible is the word of God. Which cause you then to believe the story of Jesus' death, his burial, subsequent resurrection, his ascension to glory. Let's go to Luke chapter 13. How are we going to get this person born of woman? How, how are we going to get this person on the right track? A little situation developed. You know, I mean, okay, so when the riots break out in Portland, okay, and the mob breaks loose and it starts burning buildings and, you know, shooting lasers in the eyes of, of officers and stuff like that. You know, we say, hey, you know, I mean, how many here heard about the, the riots? We'll just call them riots. How many heard about the riots in Portland? Let me do it this way. How many haven't heard the riots in Portland? See, stuff like that spreads, doesn't it? Okay, well, they had a similar situation. They said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, did you hear about the fact that the soldiers came right down out of the fortress and they came down to where the guys are off in the sacrifice and they butchered them right there, cut them to pieces with the sword so their blood mingled with the sacrifices. See how something like that would spread, right? That spread through Israel. You hear? I mean, sad, you know, sad when the forces of tyranny can break out that bit, right? Verse 2, Luke 13, 2, Jesus said to him, You suppose these Galileans? were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they, they suffered this fate? 
And here's the key line. He says, I tell you no. Unless you repent, you'll all like perish. Choice here. You know, repent or perish. Repent means to bring our thinking in line with God. Change metanoia. Change the mind. Change the way we think. Okay. Uh, Latin, repent is actually from Latin based. Greek is metanoia. You know, like metamorphosis, change form, metanoia, change your mind. Latin is re repent. That, that comes into English. See, for example, if somebody's pensive, they're thoughtful. See, the P-E-N has to do with thinking. And re means change. You know what repent means? Well, change the way you think. Just like metanoia means change the way you think. Okay. You got it? Right. So we've got to bring our thinking <laughs> into line with God's thinking. See, and Jesus makes the point in verse 4. He said, How, you heard about the, the guys there, the 18 guys <laughs> that the Tower of Siloam fell on and killed them? You heard about that. He said, do you think they were greater sinners than anybody else? He said, I'm telling you, unless you repent, you're going to perish. The point's pretty clear, isn't it? So maybe you ought to take a look at that repent thing a little bit more, right? Turn to Matthew 10. See, another thing that changes here is as the, the new covenant begins to take full force. Is the day of the secret disciple is gone. See, remember we talked about the, the two different groups of guys coming to the cross of Jesus. Well, one of those guys, this guy named Joseph of Arimathea, he was a rich guy. He had enough pull power to go to Pontius Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. So he and his men came. Do you think Joseph personally is going to take that body down off the cross? That's what he hires people for. And he pulled them. See, so it was a group of men that came, and you know, one guy isn't going to get a body down off a cross that's about eight feet in the air anyway. See, so it was his guys that came, okay? Joseph was a secret disciple. He was on the Jewish high council, but it's a secret. You know, the other group of guys coming, bringing 100 pounds of spices, they're with Nicodemus. Now, he's another rich guy. He isn't carrying the spices, okay? And on 100 pounds of spices. He's got his guys doing that, okay? And uh, so they come. Joseph and Nicodemus is also on the Jewish high council. And he's a disciple of Jesus, but he's a secret disciple also. But once the gospel begins to take effect in Acts chapter 2, the day of the secret disciple is gone. You're going to be a disciple of Jesus, that's going to be a public thing. In uh, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus makes this statement here, verse 32. Matthew 10, 32, he says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. All right, Jesus, good deal. You know, I'll, I'll confess you periodically. Uh, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Oh. See, the record, you know, Fox's Book of Martyrs and some of these other things show that the early Christians, they'd go to their death. They would not confess that Caesar was Lord because to confess that Caesar was Lord was to deny that Jesus was. Because if you confess that Caesar is Lord, you're saying he's God. And they wouldn't do it. They'd die. Died by the millions, by the hundreds of thousands when the Romans started their systematic persecution of Christians. Okay, that's something we've got to look at. See, the day of the secret disciple, gone. You, you want to be loose from your bonds? Okay. You're willing, right from the beginning, to say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you look at John chapter 20, John tells you why he writes this book, this gospel account here. John 20, verse 30. We used to talk about 2020 vision. Nobody wants to talk about 2020 anymore. <laughs> uh, John 20, 30. He said, therefore, are many other signs Jesus also performed. I was going to do a series on 2020s instead of 1616s. 
but I changed my mind. You know, did the 16, 16. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of, his, of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. See, this has been written so that you can believe that and then make that confession that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, so you're not willing to do that? I deny you. You're not willing to do that on a continual basis? You know what? I'll deny you. Okay. The day of the secret disciple gone. I mean, you want to be loose from your bonds? Stay loose from your bonds? You've got to process it. Anything else? Oh, yeah, Acts chapter 2. First time in the history of the world the gospel's preached and what to do about it. <clears throat> Nothing said after this is ever going to contradict it. It may amplify it, but it's never going to contradict it. It's not going to be in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that's going to contradict Acts 2, 38. Okay? <clears throat> Peter said to them, they want to know what to do. Peter said to repent, each of you, literally be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how you're going to be loosed from your sins. That's how those of us born and woman are going to be loosed from our sins, is by believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, by our willingness to be repentant, a willingness to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, to be immersed by his authority for the forgiveness of our sins and to receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's the only way. Anything different from that is a lie. If, it, if it's 98%, if they get it 98% correct, you know what? It's still a lie. It's a lie. See, it's stabbing, stabbing into the darkness. Jesus is the light that came into the world. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness does not comprehend it. It's not processing it. Mark chapter 16. Jesus, knowing what's coming, tells the apostles before his ascension, after his resurrection, before his ascension, Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, Mark 16, 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has been believed and has been immersed shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. There it is. You want to be loosed? You want to be loosed? That's how you do it. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter your background. Doesn't matter if you're the poor slave girl who has to sleep behind the mill wheel. Doesn't matter whether you're Pharaoh living in the luxury of the palace. It's the same plan for everybody. It's open for it's good news. You can't be loosed. There's no amount of money that you could use to pay for it. Jesus paid it. All he asks of you is your life. He who loves his life loses it. He who loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save. That's all he asks is your life. But what was your life apart from him anyway? See, back to Psalm 116. See, when a person follows this. He believes the scripture. He, he follows the teaching of scripture. He's obedient to the gospel and he maintains his belief in the gospel. Then Psalm 116, 15 kicks in. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Isn't that an amazing scripture? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. 
What's the Christian got to fear? His death is precious to God. Physical death. No fear. Just moving forward, confidence. When you're not afraid of death, you can't be manipulated. That's, a, that, that's an awesome concept from scriptures. When you're not afraid to die, you can't be manipulated. See, and what's going on is mass manipulation for a public that is afraid to die. Well, they should deal with it scripturally. Verse 16, O Lord, surely I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of a handmaid. You have loosed my bonds. See, isn't that exciting to be able to say that? To you I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, may it be in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Good news. Good news. Maybe there's somebody here today that wants to be loosed from the shackles of sin. Wants to be set free from the cords that bind them, that restrict their thinking, that continue to shove them down into the muck in the, in the miry clay, as the scripture put it. If that's you and you want release today and you know what you're doing, you're willing to confess Jesus as Lord, be immersed into him. If that's you, and then now's the time you step up here as we stand. See, God wants us as Christians to be in remembrance of where we came from. That way ne we never forget the value of what we have. By Remembering the value of what we have, then we're excited to communicate that to somebody else, to help them understand, to begin to process. It's, there's a lot of education here. You know, it has to go on. It takes, it takes a while, a lot of times, to, to process our way through, you know, depending on how little or how much scripture knowledge we've had in the past. Sometimes what we thought was scripture knowledge in the past actually was mis misdirected us. But everybody's got to begin that process, and you know, where should a person begin? Well, where they are. I mean, where else would you begin? Right where you are. But God's got gospel, good news for us, and we can be released, we can be free, we can be new creatures, and we can have a purpose and a cause. So we can praise the Lord in the courts of the Lord, in the midst of the great assembly.